They're on sulfides and native metals. At the top, examples of native copper from the upper Michigan Peninsula. Common sulfides include iron, copper, zinc, lead, arsenic, antimony, and mercury. I'm John Dillis from Oregon State University. Why do we care about sulfides and associated native metals? Sulfides are the main source of many metallic mineral ores, including copper, gold, platinum. In global industry, metals are worth $200 billion or more annually and $30 billion or more in the USA, with a total economic impact of more than $500 billion. However, there are important Sulfides are important sources of environmentally damaging and acid mine drainage and acid rain. Porphyry copper deposits, for example, produce about 65% of global copper, nearly all the molybdenum, 35% of the gold. One of the largest in the world is the Bingham deposit in Utah. It's mined three cubic kilometers of rock and produced about 20 million metric tons of copper. That's what the world uses each year. So we have to constantly look for new sources of copper as it's mined out. On the right, a giant landslide that moved about 100 million tons of rock down to the bottom of the pit. At the bottom, you can see some small, small haul trucks and the top giant uh, shops that, for maintenance. This is Corvallis, Oregon where Oregon State University is located, and note that the site of the Bingham ore deposit is about the same as a town of 50,000 people. Native metals include gold, copper, silver. The abbreviations in the periodic table of the elements are AU, CU, AG, from the Latin, aurum, cuprum, argentum. Native metals have isometric commonly octahedral forms. They're composed of cubic close-packed atoms of gold in octahedral coordination. These are metallic bonds, so gold, copper, are malleable, ductile. Gold is soft. It's sectile, cuts with a knife. It's the best electrical conductor after copper. However, gold is chemically resistant to acids and mechanical abrasion, therefore it's used for contacts in electronic gear as the most reliable contacts. Native gold or gold-silver alloys, which is called electrum, is the common gold ore mineral in hydrothermal veins. Gold is also concentrated in placer or stream deposits at the base of gravels due to gold's very high specific gravity, more than 19 grams per cubic centimeters and gold is extremely rare on the order of one parts per billion in the crust. Now let's look at sulfides. Sulfides have a general formula MEXSY, where ME is a metal cation, typical charge are plus one, two, and three. S is the sulfide anion, whose ionic radius is about 1.7 angstroms, slightly larger than oxygen, which means that it is holds its electrons less strongly than oxygen and forms more, uh, ion, more ionic rather than covalent bonds. Commonly, sulfides occur as minor rock-forming minerals in reduced rocks that have not been in contact with the atmosphere. Typically, sulfides are opaque, metallic, dense, relatively soft, and highly colored and they have high electrical conductivity. Some sulfides are formed by magmatic processes, as immiscible sulfide melts separate from silicate magmas. Most sulfides are formed by hydrothermal fluids, that is hot water and dissolved ions at room temperature to magmatic temperatures. Sulfides typically have fairly simple crystal structures and atomic arrangements. Many are isometric or tetragonal. An example here is given as sphalerite, and sphalerite is the same structure as diamond, which has a tetrahedrally coordinated carbons. That would mean one carbon is bonded to four additional carbons around it in a tetrahedron. In the case of sphalerite, zinc 2 plus replaces the central carbon 
and sulfur 2 minus replaces the four tetrahedral carbons, and we have a zinc sulfide arrangement. Calcopyrite, the common copper iron sulfide, looks exactly like sphalerite, except every other zinc is replaced alternately by copper and iron. Again, a one-to-one -one stoichiometry of metal to sulfur. Sphalerite on the lower right is a typical example. It forms tetrahedrons, octahedrons, rarely cubes, mostly complex crystals with poor, more, poor crystal morphologies. Polysynthetic twinning on the 111 plane is very common, and it has a perfect cleavage on 011. Hardness is 3.5 to 4, which is kind of intermediate among the sulfides, harder than some and softer than a few. The luster is characteristic. It's non-metallic to resinous and translucent, and the colors vary from white to black with increasing iron content. Commonly, sphalerite is yellow to yellow-brown, and it has a yellowish to yellowish-brown streak. A, a polymorph of sphalerite is called wurzite. Important solid solutions include the following. In addition to iron, which can be up to 50 mol percent of the sphalerite, sphalerite can hold up to half a weight percent cadmium, as well as indium, gallium, germanium. All of these are ore minerals as byproducts of sphalerite mining, which is a chiefly the chief zinc ore in the world. Galena is the this example. It's isometric. It has an NaCl structure where sodium and chlorine are in octahedral or six-fold coordination. So this ha galenas have very low bond strength. For example, we can calculate it using Pauling's rules by the charge divided by the coordination number. So lead is a plus two charge, has coordination of s number of six, so the bond strength is 0.33, which is a very low bond strength. Consequently, it has low hardness, but it has very high specific gravity because of the presence of lead. Commonly formed cubic forms, as shown in the upper right, and sometimes octahedral forms, as shown in the lower right. It has a beautiful and perfect 001 cleavage, and that's perpendicular to the A1, A2, A3 axes, as you can see in the upper right. And it has a metallic luster. Color and streak are lead gray, and it's an ore mineral of lead, often containing significance in silver. Occurs as veins and replacements of limestone with sphalerite, pyrite, and marcasite. Calcopyrite is the chief ore mineral of copper, and it's CuFeS2, tetragonal. It's commonly brass yellow or tarnished bronzy or iridescent, has a streak that's greenish black, mm -hmm. and it's relatively poorly crystalline, massive forms, and rarely tetrahedral shapes. Hardness is three to four, softer and darker yellow than pyrite, and it has a characteristic streak that pyrite does not. It's the most common hydrothermal ore mineral of copper associated with quartz, pyrite, and bornite. Finally, let's look at pyrite. Pyrite is isometric, another cubic uh, crystal class, and it's the most common sulfide. It's often called fool's gold because it has a pale yellow color similar to gold. However, it's a hydrothermal mineral. It melts at 743 degrees C, and it's commonly brass yellow, but it may tarnish, kind of yellows and browns or rust color. It's very hard for a sulfide, six to six and a half, and it characteristically fractures brittly with a conchoidal fracture unlike gold, which is sectile and malleable. It does not fracture. It forms striated cubes, rare octahedrons, as shown on the upper right and to the right. And rarely it forms pyridohedrons. These are 12, 12 pentagon-shaped faces, as shown in the center and low. And rarely it may form iron cross twins. 
Pyrite has very important environmental consequences. In ores, particularly that are pyrite rich, it can weather to form iron sulfate rich water. For ex example, in the upper right, that's this reddish brown muck in the water derived from weathering of pyrite rich ores in the Lexington mine at Butte, Montana. In addition to forming in ores, pyrite is very common in sedimentary rocks with hydrocarbons or in coal beds. Re relatively resistant to weathering, pyrite can oxidize, particularly in, by bacteria, to form limonites. These are iron, ferric iron hydroxides, such as gertite, lipidocrosite, often forming as pseud pseudomorphs of the original pyrite cubes. Oxidation of pyrite generates sulfuric acid, so a huge environmental impact is acid mine drainage of pH less than 2 water, derived from sulfuric acid. The sulfuric acid reaction is shown as follows. We start with pyrite, FeS2. You add oxygen from the air and water from the environment, and it oxidizes the pyrite to make ferrous sulfate, and H2SO4, which is sulfuric acid. Burning of pyrite-rich coal, which commonly contains 1 to 2 percent sulfur, and smelting of sulfides also produce SO2, which is a gas. It goes into the atmosphere where water may react with it to form sulfuric acid and consequently produce acid rain, which is a pr big problem for the northeastern U.S. and adjacent Canada. As an example, here's the Butte, Berkeley Pit in Butte, Montana. It's in the center of the, of the map on the lower left. The pit was abandoned in the 1980s, and by 1990, the water had risen and the pH had dropped to 2.1 due to pyrite weathering. And a flock of Canada geese landed on the lake and were killed by the acidic conditions. Gradually, as the water has risen, more rock containing feldspar has buffered the pH, and now it's about pH of 5. And acid mine drainage is treated this way, by buffering with feldspars or calcite. So in summary, sulfides and native metals are important economic ore minerals. Sulfides have S2- as the anion and form from sulfur-rich magmas and hydrothermal fluids. There are many, many type, different types of sulfides, but they typically are sparse, less than 5 volume percent of rocks. However, iron sulfides are important rock-forming minerals in minor amounts. Sulfides, especially pyrite, contribute via weathering to acid mine drainage, and when burned or smelted, produce acid rain. Thank you. I'll be glad to answer any questions offline.